Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm pleased to welcome Hap Klopp to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. He's here to discuss his book, Almost, about entrepreneurship, lessons, and failures in the Silicon Valley. Hap founded the North Face and served as president and CEO for two decades. He has since run numerous companies and spoken around the world on adventuring, leadership, entrepreneurship, and the human side of management. He has appeared on national television and in several publications, including Forbes and the Wall Street Journal. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm glad to be here. I would like to sort of preface my comments by telling you that my epithet, if there's ever one written, is going to be often wrong but never in doubt. I'm a classic serial entrepreneur, and so all of my comments kind of come from that direction. Uh, as mentioned, I founded uh, the North Face right out of business school. After I finished Stanford, the, uh, a lot of people thought we were crazy. We had no fear of failure. Uh, we created a whole new industry. There wasn't an industry. We created backpacking by taking materials from the Vietnam uh, War and applied them to general camping. We took uh, aircraft aluminum, we made tent poles and pack frames, we took parachute cloth, and we made sleeping bags, tents and, and funky clothing, and that was the basis of it. Well, I can tell you that most people thought when we were talking about this and as I was leaving school, they, they thought we were crazy, that nobody would ever buy backpacking gear. Uh, but as I said, it's a two and a half billion dollar company now, I'm no longer involved with it, but it's, uh, it, the idea may not have been so bad. Admittedly, you know, when I left the business school, I have what I call that NC2A look, no clue at all. But we knew what we wanted to do. We really wanted to build a great business. And so uh, we set about doing it. And, and we had no fear. Uh, that's the great thing about leaving school. You're not leaving anything behind. You're just starting something as you go. So we, we had this attitude that you know, we avoided all the naysayers because we didn't believe that uh, anything was wrong. We felt if we could build a company that was maybe $10 million in sales, made a million dollars a year, that that would be a great thing. Uh, nothing like a billion dollar company. We didn't really think about that. But I can tell you the same things apply now that applied then, and I would encourage you to, uh, to have the same attitude, which is basically you know, uh, realize that the next 10 years are going to be the best years of your life. Don't, don't listen to the newspapers, don't listen to the news, don't read it on your, uh, your computer, because all you'll hear is bad news. If Jesus were to walk on water today, the reports in the media are going to be Jesus can't swim because everything is negative and that's the way it's interpreted. And so you have to avoid that. And if you want to be a great entrepreneur, if you want to build a great business, effectively what you have to do is live with risk. Uh, you have to live with uncertainty. You have to live with failure. But that's not the worst thing in the world. As Mark Twain said about Wagner's music, it's not nearly as bad as it sounds. And let me tell you about that, because if you look around now, if you look at Silicon Valley and look at the attitude that's there, what you find is a re unique, remarkable atmosphere that doesn't have fear, takes big chances, attempts to dent the universe. It's an environment which encourages people to take risk. And that risk is what's differentiating people right now in this world. If you look at it, I'll come back to it later on, but the world is in a malaise. If you look at the problems in uh, global economics, China in particular, if you look at the climate change issues that are happening, the number of wars around the world, I mean, all those things can paralyze you. But the reality is, if you start a business and drive a business, you're in control. Those aren't the things that drive it. And what you see is the attitude that you have, and you see it inculcated here in this company, in this town. You certainly see it in Silicon Valley, a little bit in Boston. But you don't see it in Dubuque. You don't see it in a lot of other places around the country. So what you have to do is recognize that there's something really neat, something unique, something that is you, that is special, that's actually going to win. Now, most of you know Steve Jobs, obviously. Uh, Jack Dorsey. I think most people know Jack Dorsey, Twitter, Square, uh, Mark Andreessen, 
Netscape, now he has Andreessen and Horowitz, Max Levitchin, PayPal, uh, Slide, Yelp, worked with Peter Thiel, worked with Elon Musk, pretty good crowd. You know what's common amongst all of those people? They all failed and got kicked out of their first business. Now, any place but Silicon Valley, that would be a blemish on your record. People would be afraid of you. They wouldn't back you again. But as you know from the record that all of those people have, they've been embraced. People really like them. They like them because they failed. Because there's a feeling, and that feeling is that you, if you're in a highly scalable, rapidly scalable business, what you have to do is make fast decisions, you have to make quick decisions, and they have to be ones that you're certain of. And the issue of failure helps you make those decisions. Now there's some uh, VCs that I know in Silicon Valley that will tell you, and they've told me, they won't fund a new company unless they see a few people in management who've already failed in another business. Not failure because failure is great. It's failure because they learn and they know what not to do. If you want to scale a business rapidly, you can't afford to organically build your team the way you could do it if it's a slow growth. So you're looking for people to step in who are going to take action and act like they've been there before. Now, if you look at Silicon Valley, it's primarily funded by venture capital companies. Venture capital companies have a five to seven year funding cycle. They invest and they want to get out within that period of time. They look at their portfolio, usually it's about 10 companies that they'll invest in. They expect two to be home runs, be actually the unicorns that you're gonna have. They expect two to be outright failures. And the other six, what they have there is companies that they have to get rid of because they don't wanna give their limited partners back shares. So they will sell them off, merge them out, whatever they can do to get rid of them. And usually the management and usually the initial shareholders, friends and family, don't end up with the money. The VCs end up with the money. So in essence, eight out of 10 of the companies in Silicon Valley fail. But if you were to listen to the press or if you look and read all of the stories, it seems like that's not the case, that everything's a unicorn that starts in Silicon Valley. Start it, you're gonna be a billionaire. It doesn't work, but it's okay because you can come back again and again and again. Now, those who go to Silicon Valley, and I speak with a lot of universities that have immersion programs for people coming in, are trying to find out what's a silver bullet? You know, what makes a difference there? And sure, it's universities and the attachment of the universities to uh, the business community, the number of students coming out, they're really smart and quick and, and with the latest knowledge. Uh, and there's a lot of financing. Financing comes from VCs, it comes from banks. Banks will invest in companies, will loan you money when you don't have much in the way of assets. Silicon Valley Bank is a classic example. You have lawyers and you have an accountants who've taken companies from inception to IPO, and they will do it pro bono at the outset, uh, or they'll at least defer their fees until you're rich and they can take you to an IPO. But all of those things could be taken anywhere else in the world. I can tell you, I've worked in New Zealand, I've worked in Europe, I've consulted companies around the globe, and it doesn't happen in a lot of places It's there uh, that you can do that. But you can take all of those things and they try to set up development groups and they still don't get the successes that we get in a Silicon Valley environment. And the reason is the culture is different. The culture is what's really the differentiator. Uh, and it's a culture which embraces failure, as I said. It's a culture which doesn't put a blemish on your record. If you, uh, if you fail, if you've tried something really great, it always welcomes new. If you're trying to have scalable companies, you have all sorts of new ideas. You have a new idea such as Agile. You have a new idea such as uh, design thinking, David Kelly's work that he has. He's got the IDEO uh, start company, but he has the uh, design school at Stanford that always talks about. It's basically rapid iteration, quick decision making, throwing things out that don't work. Uh, also, uh, if you think about it, here's an example from Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, their new headquarters, they took over from Sun Microsystems a few years ago, had a lot of different pods. The headquarters pod, where he's located and some others are located, uh, changed their building inside. In the first 18 months, they changed it nine times. And Zuckerberg's comment was, we have to move as fast internally as we want to move externally. Now you can imagine what it's like and how disruptive it would be if you have nailing, wires coming in and everything every two months. But to be as efficient as it is in Silicon Valley, that's required. Yet what the difference is, is really what you have is a culture that's defined by failing forward. And Thomas Edison probably said it best. He said, you know, I've never failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that something doesn't work. 
And that's really the right attitude to have because, and, and it's really true, most people say that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb. What he did was buy a patent, the patent for an incandescent bulb, but only lasted about three seconds. And what he realized was if you've got the right materials together, you could come up with a long lasting light bulb. And so what he did is he set about taking the table of elements and he just tried every single element singularly and in combination until he came up with the right one that lasted. But his attitude was, I'm not failing when these don't work. I know I'll finally get to the right selection. As I see it, it's really the scientific method applied to business. The scientific method, is, as probably most of you know, is basically taking a hypothesis in science, trying ideas against it, rejecting those things that don't work. In business, for some reason, the general thinking, the general knowledge is everything's got to work. If it doesn't work, get a bigger hammer and make it work. But, but why not apply the scientific method to business? Try things, iterate, quickly decide, fail forward. If it doesn't work, reject it, move on. It's okay. Now, I wrote the book, which we talked about almost, that they have back there for you. And I wrote about it to talk about failure. I wrote it to talk about the environment that exists in a high pressure startup in a company, partly because nobody writes about failures. Uh, when I talked with the publishers, they said, go into the bookstores and see how many sections you have on failure. Not any. And I said, but bookstores are failing, so maybe that's their problem. <laughs> uh, but Another reason to do it is basically, if you read about some failures, you don't have to repeat it. It's the old OPM, you know, learn on other people's money, other people's mistakes. It's a lot easier to do that. I can guarantee you, you'll make plenty of mistakes on your own, even if all of the mistakes that we write about, you learn and don't repeat. Some of the ideas that are in the book, there are really five basic reasons why this company failed, and they're told in a narrative, non-fiction way, so it's, it's entertaining. Uh, it isn't the seven effective habits of highly effective people, nor is it four P's of marketing or those sorts of things. It's a story told in real life, how it is in 12 months, the up and down, all of the greed, the hubris, the friction, the excitement, the possibilities. But buried in there are five reasons why this company failed. The first one was that you can't have multiple cultures in a small company. You can only have one. We had a classic conflict between sales and engineering. And we, we described it as, do you make what you can sell or do you sell what you can make? The engineers, the R&D people always wanted to make a new product. They never wanted to make two. We couldn't do A-B tests because no two things were the same. The salespeople always wanted to make lots and lots of what was selling. You needed to have a balance of the two, but for reasons I'll come to, we didn't have that. So we had those two cultures conflicting as we went through. The second thing that caught us up was the myth of overnight success. Overnight success takes years. There's a few outliers, Instagrams and others, but usually it takes a long time to be successful. And but that's not the theory, and that's not what people hear. And particularly around Silicon Valley, people are drawn by the muses of, say, we're going to get rich overnight. Well, that happened to this company. It was a company making miniaturized portable power that could be embedded in any consumer good to be able to, be able to make people more mobile and take all of their devices with them. It could provide heat on demand and clothing, it could provide charging and running of any device. But, and it had fuel cells and had batteries and everything trying to hook together. We had a visit from one of the largest companies in Silicon Valley that was into consumer goods. And the moment they showed up, all financial discipline, all business disciplines went away because the CEO believed that instantly this company was going to buy us for $100 million or $200 million. So all the things that we needed to do to build a long-term business were thrown away. Well, they didn't buy us for $100 million. They talked with us. We talked about doing some joint development, but everything else went out the door. Everybody who believed in the overnight success ended up suffering as a result of it. The third thing that we ran into is the old adage that when you run out of business, you make bad decisions. We ran out of business. Once the disciplines dropped, we ended up $2 million in debt. And so we had to make decisions about products that were rolling to the market. What we did was make a critical decision. We didn't invest in manufacturing engineering ongoing. We had R&D engineering, but we didn't test for repeated use thousands of times in the field. And there was failures after a period of time in the field, so there had to be a recall because we didn't invest in that last thing. It was only going to be about another $50,000, but we just didn't have it and didn't invest in it. The next thing that caused it was failing to plan is planning to fail. 
once again, because of the belief that we were going to have $100 million by the end of the year, basically not to worry, right? The fact that we're $2 million in debt, no problem. Uh, well, a story that kind of underscores that is that uh, while we're $2 million in debt, I went to the CEO and I said, I don't believe anybody's going to buy us at the end of the year, but I think I can get, raise enough money for us uh, to be able to get us through. And if we have a payment plan, people will probably persevere with us. And I said, I, don't, I know I can't get $2 million right away, but I think I can get $500,000, $700,000. And I, I was able in three weeks to get them $700,000 to fund the company. We had a plan to pay $147,000 out over the course of the, of the next few months to be able to keep everybody at bay while we raised the rest of the money in case we didn't sell out at the end of the year. Well, we got the 700,000 in, we got it in in three weeks. I was pretty proud of that because it usually takes a little bit longer to raise that type of money. I looked at the bank account the day after we put the money in the company and you know how much money was left in the bank account the next morning? $47. We didn't have enough money to pay payroll that day. So I, I went to the CFO and I said, what the hell's going on? And he said, well, you know, I said, we don't have enough money for payroll. He said, well, I left enough in the bank account for payroll. I said, well, what happened to our plan? We had a plan. We're going to pay 147000 The rest, he said, well, the CEO had to pay other things. And I said, well, I've got two problems with that. I said, the first problem is that not only do we not have enough money, but we had a plan. The plan just went out the door. We're going to have to find more money. I don't know where we're going to find it. The second problem I have with that is our whole discipline is again broken down. What's wrong? And he said, well, I left enough money in the bank account. I said, well, I'll go look at it. So I looked at it, looked at it online and matched it up against the bank balance. But, you know, I, I'm thinking to myself, you can't have money come in one day and it's gone the next morning. Those checks have to have been written two weeks ago and they never told me about it. Well, I went back and I, and I said, what happened? here are three checks that don't show up in the check register. He said, well, I don't know. I guess the CEO wrote them on his own. I've never seen those. So, so we didn't have a lot of discipline. But once again, this belief that we're going to get rich by Christmas, don't worry about it. It's going to be covered over at the end. The fifth point we had was basically a lot of people in the company believe that innovation is solely invention. The Better Mousetrap Company, if you just make something new, it's going to be great. Innovation is a combination of invention plus commercialization. If you can't actually take it to market, earn something, you're going to lose. And this company didn't focus on that because we didn't think we had to. We thought we were going to sell patents for money, I guess. But anyway, all of those things are what brought this company down. Now, there's a lot of other types of mistakes that I've seen in other companies I've worked with that I'll, I'll just tell you about, uh, come back to them later on. But uh, these will also bring you down, as it did this company, Artica, that I was involved with. The first one is if you have the wrong business model. A lot of people just won't admit failure on their business model. So if it isn't working, they just try harder and harder to push the same model through. But it's the old joke about the fact, try doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. It just doesn't happen. Sometimes you've got to pivot. I have seen hundreds of business plans for companies and I can say, without exception, I've never seen one business that ultimately adhered to the business plan. Again, I've talked with a few VCs, and I said, what do you think of business plans? And they said, so we always ask them to do it, but we never read them. <laughs> I said, why is that? They said, well, we know that's not what is going to be there. We've just had to figure out, do they know the discipline of how to put it together and what all the issues are? But we're not going to rely on that. We're going to rely on the people, actually, to come up with the right pivot. The second thing that I think I've seen happen a lot is too much complexity. You know, you, you bring in the McKinsey's of the world, the Bain's, Accenture, and they come up with these elegant solutions to a problem. They're so elegant in their three-dimensional capabilities that the only people in the world that can possibly execute them are the consulting companies. It is lifelong employment. In reality, Execution is required in business, and that requires simplicity. It requires a lot of people working together. It isn't this academic study of what is going to happen. I tell people, keep the main thing the main thing. Figure out what it is you're doing. Focus all your energies on that, and that's how you win. Another thing I see is lack of sense of urgency that exists out there. There's an exponential rate of change in society. 95% of all patents ever issued were issued in the last five years. That's not all great patents, of course. A lot can go through. But it is a logarithmic change that is happening. 
And the society is moving so much faster in today's world that we have to respond in a quicker way. If you don't do it, you're going to lose out. And I can tell you a story. One of the things I've done since I've sold North Face Consulting, and I, I, I generally like to work with smaller companies because you feel more impact of what you're doing, but I ended up with a large company. A guy told me all sorts of problems. He said, come on in. And so I, w I went into his office. He was late to the meeting. But I figured I'd interview a lot of people around the company and then come up with a conclusion. Everybody inside the company knows what the problems are. Most people just don't want to speak about them. So I, I looked at it, and he came in, and I knew this wasn't going to be good for my consulting practice. But I said, you know, I think I know what the problem is right now. He said, what is it? And I said, well, it's you. He said, what do you mean? I said, you look like you hate your job. He said, well, it's really true. I said, well, how are you going to motivate anybody? He said, well, you know, I, I stay at home. I read my emails. You know, I, I check the news. I have a cup of coffee, check newspaper. He said, whatever I can do to keep from coming into the office. He said, when I finally can't come up with a reason to stay out of the office, I come in. I said, well, why don't you quit? He said, well, I only have 15 more years till retirement. Well, that mentality kills large companies. That's why small companies can survive, because they don't have that. They have this fear of failure. They have a desire to survive. They're willing to change on a dime and be able to do that. A second cause of failure that I've seen is the inability to flex between having sort of collegial decision making and having very decisive decision making. A lot of people like to be liked, but great <coughs> leaders aren't always liked. Great leaders make tough decisions. If you set a collegial environment, that works fine, except when you come to a crisis. When you get into a crisis, you have to have quick decision making and somebody has to step out there. Now, if you're going back and forth, people may not know how to deal with you, but the reality is you have to make quick decisions. And a story that underscores that is a story of a climbing friend of mine, Durenfirth. He, he was climbing Everest. Uh, he had done it as a youth. He no longer could do it, so he put together teams of people. And he put together a team of six people, four of whom had already climbed Everest, and they were going up this route. And they made it Camp 3. Bad weather was coming in, which is the usual problem up there. And at Camp 3, he called everybody together in his tent, and he said, okay, let's vote on which way we're going to go to the top of Everest. Well, the four people who had already summited Everest did not want to go to the South Call, which is the easiest way. There's already steps there, the Hillary steps, ropes and whatever. Uh, they wanted to, two wanted to climb th some rock, two wanted to go on an ice route. The two people who had never climbed Everest, of course, wanted to go to South Call because they wanted to get it into the record book. So they argued all day long, and at the end of the day, they packed up, went down the hill. That was the end of their climb. They failed. The reason they failed is Durham Firth at that point didn't say, I'm the leader. And this is the decision we're going to have. He wanted it still to be collegial. Another reason companies fail is basically a lack of passion, a lack of passionate commitment to success. If you're in sales, I'd ask you, when was the last time that you cried when you lost a sale? Literally cried that it cared that much. I can tell you some of your competitors are thinking that way. And you have to care that much to be able to win. You have to be that passionate about it. If you're that passionate and you're the leader of the company, leader of a section, leader of a group, what you will find is people follow you. Because what you say is often forgotten. They usually tell a speaker that 30% of what you say is remembered. What is remembered is the passion, the commitment, the direction, whether you're, you have their back if you're leading it. And so what you want to be as that leader is that passionate individual that everybody's drawn to and follows. So another story about a friend of mine that I was reminded this weekend, so I bring it up again, his name is Dickie Buick. And Dickie Buick was this skier. In my days, he was the guy that whenever he was in town, the word was around the bars or whatever, Dickie Buick is here, let's go ski with him. Because everybody wanted to ski with Dickie. Well, the reason was he was so passionate and he committed to it. But one day, Dick was getting ready for a race. He had his downhill skis on, he got on the wrong run, and he ended up on a ski jump. He flew off the ski jump, hit a tree 30 feet in the air, crashed to the ground, hauled him in on a sled, and he said, Doc, patch me up, I race tomorrow. 
And the doctor said, you know, I don't think you understand. You, you, you're going to have a full-length cast tomorrow. You're not going to race. And Dickie said, you don't, you don't understand, Doc. I'm Dickie Buick. I race. And the doctor said, well, how are we, we going to accomplish that? And he said, very simply. He said, all you do is put my full-length cast in a racing tuck. I'll race tomorrow. Now, he did race. He didn't win because at that level, you can't win. But the passion and the commitment to being involved in that was why Dickie Buick was followed by everybody. And as a leader, that is what you want. If you don't have that and your competition does, you may lose out to them. Now, as I mentioned, you know, the, the world around us is in a malaise with the exception of the tech world. Most businesses are in a bad shape because of the China problem, the international global problems, problems of weather, the problem of climate change, population explosion. But we don't want to let that drag us down because it's going to stay that way until somebody makes a difference and we are the people who can make the difference. It starts with optimism, positive mental attitude. You know, I, I tell people, follow my rule, the 80-20 rule. Don't tell people your problems because 80% don't care and 20% are glad you got them. The reason we are where we are in the business world today, I believe, is a fear of failure. I think it's a land of can't, but I believe that we can. I mean, experts know all the reasons something won't work, but the experts are the ones who are failing us. It's a society dominated by lawyers and MBAs, which are risk-averse professions. I mean, lawyers are the ones who write a 10,000-word document and call it a brief. That gives you some idea of their approach to it. But what I can tell you is, don't be afraid of failure. Use failure to learn. And I'll give you is, is some comments that maybe will stick with you that I've learned that you can apply as well uh, to uh, try to get success from failure. The first one is, is don't confuse planning and strategy with execution. Execution almost always wins. As I said earlier, these great plans that are put together by the Baines, McKinsey's, Accenture's that are too complex, they won't win in the real world when execution is there. The second thing is avoid perfection paralysis. In this exponential logarithmic change of society, there's not time for perfect information. Voltaire long ago said it best, which is basically, perfection is the enemy of good. You have to be able to make quick decisions in today's marketplace. A third one is it always takes twice as long and it costs three, much, three times as much as you plan. I don't know why that's the case. You know, I go out and do consulting, and I would think with 40 years' worth of experience and, and failure and success, I would know that. But every new situation seems to generate that same thing. So you have to plan when you're asking for money or raising money. You have to plan for the fact that it may take longer, it may cost more. It doesn't mean it's a bad idea. The next one is sometimes cheap is expensive, and expensive is cheap referencing back to when we didn't do the engineering uh, necessary to take a product to market, a little bit of extra money would have made the difference. Get a number and a date together, never get one. If a team is reporting to you and they just give you a number they're gonna hit, tie them down to a date. By Tuesday, we will do X. If you don't get those two together, you don't have any commitment, you don't have any accountability. Next point is that, you know, it's not price, it's value that the consumer is looking for. Always look at that when you're developing your product or your service. Today's world is a knee-jerk response to lower price because people don't know how to put value into a product, but the consumers are looking for increased value. If you look outside of the country right now to the two countries that have been driving the demand for lower price in product or in services, it's been China and India. Both of those societies have costs that are going up at 8, 9, 10% a year. The marketplace isn't aware of that yet, but that's coming to an intersection that is pretty amazing. In the apparel and footwear business, which I know, 15 years ago, the, the cost Chinese labor in manufacturing assembly was 21% of the United States. This last year, it was 62% and it's increasing dramatically. Now, one year, revalue the, the yuan, that'll give them a one year hiatus, but the reality is those costs are going up, the marketplace costs are going to go up, and as a result of that, put value in and the consumer will want that. 
It's not price, it's value. Constantly remember that. Keep your plans flexible. The only constant is change. The environment around you is moving so rapidly, if you don't have a response to that changing environment, you have a risk of failure. Probably the most important thing I can tell you that I've learned is, and this is for certain, is how do you motivate your people? There's only one sure way. Hire motivated people. <laughs> you cannot use pay schemes. You can't use any plan to take somebody who's not motivated and do it. If you have a team, figure out how to move them elsewhere or how to get rid of them because if they aren't motivated, they'll drag <coughs> you down. And the final point I'd say, and this is my own and you probably see it in the North Face, but is a commitment to providing absolutely the best quality that ever exists. That's the hardest thing to copy. People reverse engineer your products, reverse engineer your code, reverse every, everything as soon as they see it. But quality is something that is very hard to compete <coughs> with. We had a, a slogan, which we put on the wall of our company at the North Face when we designed products, which guided everything we did. And that slogan was taken from Rudyard Kipling's book, The Mary Gloucester, but he said, they copied all they could follow, but they couldn't copy our minds. So we left them sweating and stealing a year and a half behind. And that was the guiding mantra for everything we developed. Now, people say, well, quality, but that's really hard to do, particularly in this world where we're cost sensitive. I'll give you a story before I close, and that story is about a friend of mine, Peter Glenn, who is in, China, uh, in Japan. And for those of you who've been in Tokyo, you know the Ginza area. It's high-rise department stores, no little boutique stores. Well, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He was having that usual s slowness that people get when they're traveling. He figures if I get a little bit of caffeine and get it into my system, I'll be okay. I'll be good to go for the rest of the afternoon. But there's no small coffee shops. So he said, well... Where do I get a cup of coffee? Probably at the top of a department store, you're going to find that there's a coffee uh, available. It's probably a restaurant, probably not going to be very good, but I'll go up there and I'll get my caffeine load. Well, he went up there, got to the top, and he was immediately impressed because they seated him quickly. And, you know, people were well-dressed. They're speaking to him in a couple languages. He said, that's pretty good because it doesn't happen to me everywhere I go. And they gave him a, a hot towel, and he said, you know, we'd probably sell more coffee if you got a hot towel with it, but still expecting a mediocre cup of coffee. Quickly, the coffee came out, very strong aroma, and he was amazed because he looked down at it, and on top of that cup of coffee was a dollop of cream sculpted like a rosebud. He was thinking, this is pretty good. And he started to stir, and they said, no, sir, wait for a moment. And while he waited, the heat of the cup of coffee turned the rosebud into a rose petal. Why would you go anyplace else to buy a cup of coffee? <laughs> it's that simple. If you can think about your product, you think about your service, and think what you can put in there, people can't beat you out. So I would use those things to suggest that you don't have to fail. Failing isn't something you should set up to accomplish. However, if you fail, it's okay, because in today's world, People want somebody who's going to learn, try, and as Steve Jobs say, try to dent the universe. So thank you. I'll open it up to questions, small speeches. <laughs> you. We have some questions. Yes. Um, what do you think about the culture of accelerators? Or is that a, a you know, are you in Boulder? Um, no, I'm, I'm in uh, Berkeley, but I'm around San Francisco in that area. So like Techstars and, and yep. uh, Founders Institute and all these different places? It, I think accelerators work in some cases. It depends on the individual accelerator. I mean, I, but some don't work. There's a company that I was mentoring, and they were trying to import a number of foods, artisanal foods and wines from Europe. And one of the demands of the accelerator was that they immediately go out and sell some product. And the guy said, well, there's a bit of a problem with this. I have to have you know, the rights to import from companies. I have to have the governmental approval for things like importation of wine. And they said, well, if you don't do that, you're not following our accelerator process. And he said, well, I can't sell anything because I, you know, I can't do it. If, if the accelerator is inflexible and doesn't fit your need, 
it's a problem. But I've seen a lot of companies use that as a tool for initial capital and discipline. And as we're trying to speed up getting into business, time is our major enemy. And Accelerator can compress that time because what it might take you a year or two years to learn by talking to your friends and talking to other entrepreneurs and talking to people that are out there, you can go in an Accelerator in a six month period of time, you're going to learn all of those disciplines. But ultimately, the accelerator is not going to be what makes you successful or not. It's going to be you. And if you use the process and understand the process, don't get, go in and expect them to provide you all of the investors you're going to get. Don't expect them to provide the differentiation that you want. They just are going to bounce that back. I've seen probably half are great, and the other half are, you know, like society, not quite so good. Yes? An online question. Um, he says, thanks, Hap. What's your process for learning from a failure? Also, do you, uh, how do you balance trying out too many things versus giving enough time for each idea to mature and succeed? Well, there's kind of two questions there. I mean, the first one is, you know, how do you, how do you learn something from failure? I mean, th the first one is basically you have to sit down and admit a failure. And to give you one idea, one of the things we, we uh, was a big failure at North Face is we had the wrong business model. Uh, the, the better business model was a, a model which was by Phil Knight at Nike. And what we did is we wanted to grow 100% a year, 200% a year. That, that was exciting. And the usual theory that, you know, the faster you grow, the better things are going to get. The faster you grow, the more capital you need. And Phil Knight had figured this out before he went into it. Well, Phil, you know, people think of Phil as a marketing genius. And I can tell you both from knowing him and from knowing that the name of Nike for two years was Blue Ribbon Sports before they converted to Nike. I'd say he's not a marketing genius, but he's a financial genius. And what, what he'd figured out that others hadn't figured out was he needed vendor financing to grow. So he went to a vendor called Nisho EY, Japanese trading company. And Nisho EY basically said, we want more business. He said, you'll get more business if you will fund my product. You buy the product on my behalf and you fund it all the way to the retailer, in which case I'll go to, go to my bank, they'll advance uh, against that receivable and I'll be able to grow. And you know, the Nishiro, I said, that's great, but we're at risk. He said, no, you won't be at risk because I promise you I'll do two things. The first one is I'm gonna give you all of my purchase orders from my customers and I will not order one pair of boots that I don't have an order for. Most of us were buying a lot of inventory, put it in the warehouse, trying to ship the extra. He said, I won't buy any of that. And that's why to this day, Nike still has a forward order program. He said, the second thing I'm gonna do is I'm never gonna go into a foreign country on my own money. I'm gonna go in on somebody else's money. And he said, I will go with the distributor. I will give them a contract. And that contract says I can buy it back at some point in the future if it's successful. If it's not successful, or if I don't have the money, I won't buy it back. If it is successful, then I would maybe buy it back when I go public. He used that model. They said, well, you know, you're, we're funding you. And he said, yeah, that's fine, because Japanese interest rates are 1%. Charge me eight, which was cheaper than what we had here in the US. You'll make money on your money. You'll be able to grow organically at whatever rate we can grow at. He did that. He grew it until he owed them over $400 million. He went public, paid them off. Now the subset of that story is, Nishu Iwai probably said, oh shit, $400 million account growing, they don't need me any longer. What they did is they said, what are we gonna do? They drove 30 miles across town and went to a small company called Columbia Sportswear and did exactly the same thing with Tim and Gert Boyle. Exactly the same formula. And they did the same thing until they went public, and then they bought Nishu Iwai out. Nishu Iwai didn't apply after that. But if you learn from that strategy, if you learn from that, you go out and say, okay, you, let's use vendor financing as a technique to grow. Let's not just try to constantly refinance, which is what we were doing at North Face. And every year, I was out financing the company over and over again. Now, the second question you were saying? How do you balance trying out too many things versus giving enough time for each idea to mature and succeed? Well, when I consult with companies, I generally tell them there's two words. All I tell them it's unique when I see them, but it's always the same two words. This is what success is. The first one is deselect. It doesn't matter 
what company I look at, they already are trying too many things and trying to accomplish too much. I mean, Steve Jobs was asked when he went back to Apple how he was so brilliant to pick out the ones that were going to be successful. Because he was, you know, after he took over from Scully. He said, there were a lot of great ones. I just knew we couldn't do all of them. He said, I threw away a lot that probably would have been good too. What I knew was if we focused, if we deselected, we were going to be successful. So you just have to deselect. It's okay. You can't be all things to all people. So the other thing you need to put into your products, into your service, is something called unobtainium. Unobtainium is something that they can't get from anybody else. That's what everybody wants. Instead of trying to make something that's exactly like some, somebody else's offering, make something that is really unique. And if it's unique, that will carry the day even when you have troubles getting to market, speed, delivery problems. Put on Obtanium in. Other questions? Yes? You mentioned quality. How do you balance quality and time to market? How do you balance quality and time to market? Well, hate to keep quoting him, but Steve Jobs introduced the, the Apple iPhone. Do you have any guess about what percentage of the initial iPhones were returned? 30%. In his case, and, and frankly, because Apple usually didn't originate anything, I mean, they copied product and came to market, he had to move rapidly, in his case, to be able to get there because he wasn't making a unique product and a unique offering. So his trade-off, which he made, I think, the right call on, was we're, we're going to have inferior quality, but we'll make it okay to people. Just take it back. 30%, what the hell? Give me a new one. And people weren't that upset with him. If you've got a really unique offering, or if you're offering service, or if you're offering software that's critical to a company's operation, let's say your SAP or your Oracle, and you're, you come in, and your system doesn't work, and it falls apart, and the businesses you're serving fall apart, you're, you're out of business. So in that case, you have to have an extreme focus on quality ahead of time to market. So you have to look at the impact on the market, the impact on the ultimate customer that you have to determine where you're going to make the trade-offs. And it always is trade-off. It isn't binary, absolutely perfect or absolutely bad, but it's like, do we get to a level of acceptable, you know, minimum viable product or not? And, and you define the minimum viable product by looking at the customer, understanding the customer, get in front of the customer, do tests out there, and ask them what they really need. Don't get your in-house group all deciding what a minimum viable product is because it won't reflect the real world. Other questions? Yes? What do you see as the biggest challenges for, um, for people coming from large companies getting into the startup, um, startup market? Uh, the question is, what do you see as the biggest challenge for people coming from a large company going to a startup or a startup environment? Uh, there, there are a myriad of ones, but as we mentioned just earlier when we were talking about it, is that when you're in a small company, the really exciting thing about it is that you can make fast decisions and you can pivot and change, that all the responsibility is on you, but also the joy is on you because you get the ego feedback. When you're a large company, it's better to get along and move along than to make fast decisions. Now, we always press for faster decisions and different decision making, but when you get in that small company, you can't wait around and you can't have as much certainty of going to the market. But the penalty isn't as high either. If you take a reputation of a large company and they fail on their delivery to the marketplace, it has dramatic impact. If you fail as a small company and deliver, it, it isn't going to impact very many people. You may not be critical to the people you're selling to. So the big challenge is how do you address in your mind to move quickly and not necessarily rely on on the services of three or four different people who may know things. Usually a small company doesn't have the breadth of management. It doesn't have people in quality assurance and manufacturing, supply chain, finance. And so you have to guesstimate which one is most critical to your survival. And if you've been in a large company, you say, well, I need all of those. In a small company, you won't have all of those. So how do you deal with them? And how do you prioritize or stack rank what the most important things are for, for success in your variety. Yes? And you're mentioning about uh, hiring motivated people, right? right? 
I, I, I'm curious how you are balancing motivating the people that you are already in your org and versus the one uh, you hiring the the, the, one, the motivated people. Because a lot of times those are people maybe the motivated people may not have the skill sets or right. needs that you know maybe fit your needs. How, <coughs> how are you going to grow them and versus you know? Well, the first thing is, are they motivated or not? You know, you can demotivate people probably more than you can motivate them in business. You know, you, you basically you know, treat them like mushrooms. You, know, you keep them in the dark, cover them with manure, and that's it. Uh, but what you're really trying to do is find people who are eager to learn. And so your interview process becomes the first step. The interview process is trying to define what they're interested in. And usually people use the interview to ask the same questions that show up on your CV. Well, I mean, I've never seen a bad CV. In today's world, you're an idiot if you have a bad CV because you just go online, take the CVs that are there, you fill in that, and, and you come up with a good CV. Asking the same question is going to get you the same answer. I try to go outside that and ask about things. And one thing is, are you passionate about anything? Tell me what you're passionate about. Is it music? Is it sport? Is it art? Is it design? You start talking with people. If there's nothing that you can resonate with, if nothing's passionate, I'd pass on the individual no matter how good that is. Now, you may end up with people who have a, a limited background because they may be very passionate and very, but they don't have the skills in there. Then it's your job as a manager to allocate work to them gradually. Don't give them something that's going to swamp them and is going to ruin their self-esteem or is going to get you in trouble because they basically let you down. <clears throat> so you parcel out what you give to them and you give more authority and more responsibility as they grow. But start with that person who really is passionate about it and is willing to work 20 hours a day because that's the way they are. Not because you tell them to do that, because you don't tell them to do that. It's just, you know, they're going, okay, I'll go home. Let me, let me work on this. I'll go to school. I'll take a class. I'll do that. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. There's another question online. <coughs> I think that answered one of the questions, but sort of a follow-up to, um, to the motivated folks. I would say that um, certainly at Microsoft, people are starting to work for longer periods of time than they used to. I'm wondering about, you know, so you're not always going to love every project you're on. So right. you can be a manager of someone who is demotivated. How do you, you know, if, if they're a motivated person, but they're not in a motivating place, how do you help that? Well, if you can, you try to move them around. If you're developing a new project, a new product development, what you, there's two ways you put a team together. One way is that you have a dedicated team, you take people from every division, and you bring them in. In that case, you have a better chance to try to get the, the really select people who really are motivated into your group. If the other one is basically that you're tasking people out on a period, there's a lot of challenges there. I mean, first of all, the one that a manager is willing to free up is often the person who's the least valuable to them because they don't want that to work. So, so you have a challenge. So what you have to do then is sit down and try to bring together this group and talk about the vision. People don't follow people. They follow visions. And so what you have to do is talk about what you're doing that is so great that they can be drawn to it. When they really see that you're changing the world with what you're doing, you get a different sort of person than if you say, listen, we're, what we're trying to do is make this product a little bit cheaper and we're going to knock it out six months from now. People go, you know, that's great, but you know, I know that's a job and I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but they don't get involved in it the same way. So you try and set up something which is a goal that transcends a normal job. And when they realize that they're going to change the world, when we introduced it, North Face, we introduced a tent. We worked with a guy by the name of Buckminster Fuller. And Bucky had pretty unique designs and geodesics. And he was a wonderful person to work with. But instead of telling people we're going to make another tent, we told him two things. One is you have a chance to work with Buckminster Fuller. And Bucky is one of the true design geniuses of our, our era. And the second thing is we're going to design a tent that can be replicated anywhere in the world with local materials that we will end up creating a design that will house all the homeless people in the world. And we did create that design. It hasn't rolled out. North Face isn't really interested in doing that. But when people knew they had a chance to work with Bucky and that they had a chance to solve the world's homeless problems, it, it elevated their thinking way beyond just making another goddamn tent. You know, because who needs another tent? There are plenty of tents out there and plenty of good tents out there. Time for one more question. One more question, we have time. 
I guess I've answered them all. I feel like we should wait. Someone's got one. <laughs> <laughs> if not, thank you so much. Thank you.